Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third presentation for the Water Conservation Facebook Live series. Thank you for joining us. My name is Emily Yarsinski. I'm Water Conservation Specialist with Valley Water. I will be introducing the event tonight and monitoring incoming questions and answers. So tonight's presentation is Reuse Gray Water and Rainwater in Your Yard, hosted by Justin Burks, Water Conservation Specialist with Valley Water, and manager of our gray water rebate program, an expert in landscape water use management and indoor water conservation. And you'll have his contact information to ask follow-up questions that may not be directly related to gray water use or rebates tonight. We are also joined tonight by special guest Hank Morales uh, with UC Master Gardeners. Hank became a master gardener in 2015 and is currently the lead for Marshall Caudill Park for demonstration garden and growing grounds in San Jose. We are recording this presentation, so if you missed anything, you may watch it again at another time. And those could, who could not join us tonight can watch it at any time after it's posted on our Water Conservation Videos webpage, uh, which we'll get to shortly. So please note, we have a really great turnout of attendees tonight, and we will do our best to try and answer your questions. Um, and hopefully you're, you're already in here right now, um, but if you have any audio trouble or trouble hearing us, you can use this call-in number on the screen and be sure to enter that webinar ID. Um, make sure that you click to join computer audio as well. And on the next slide, you'll see how to answer, uh, ask us questions. So my name again is Emily and I'm monitor, moderator today. And I'll be asking the questions as we go along in this presentation. Uh, please try to focus on water conservation questions today. Um, if you have any other questions, you can go to our Access Valley Water page. So to submit a Q&A, be sure to click on that box at the bottom of the screen right there and type in your question. Um, don't type in your question in the chat box as we will be providing resources for you in that chat box during the presentation. And we don't wanna get your questions buried in there. So today we've got reuse gray water and rainwater in your yard. And this is a list of the other water conservation uh, Facebook live events that we've had thus far. The two others we had in September and those videos are on our page webpage. So you can go and watch those anytime. And then our last water conservation Facebook uh, series video will be on November 18th with me. It's on becoming a leak detective at home. And on this next page, this is where you will find all of our water conservation Facebook Live videos. Um, it's right on watersavings.org and you can go there and watch these videos at any time. So with that, I'll let Justin get started and thanks so much for being here tonight with us. Thank you so much for the great introduction, Emily. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. I hope you all found us uh, as easily as possible. Uh, I'm so excited to bring two really exciting topics to you today gray water reuse and rainwater capture with our special guest, the UC Master Gardeners. Um, this is an overview of what you can expect to learn from tonight's uh, presentation. We'll, you'll get an overview of Valley Water and what types of services we offer our community. Uh, I usually say this towards the end, but I'm actually gonna talk about rebate information early on so that you can have a good frame of reference of how we can help you do the types of projects that we'll talk to you about later today. Um, and then there will be a set aside period to, uh, for questions and answers in addition to the Q&A box that Emily so uh, clearly walked you through a moment ago. Um, however, we have a ton to cover today and, um, and you may find you still have some questions by the time you're done watching this webinar particularly in how do you actually install a laundry to landscape gray water system. Uh, that YouTube link that you can see gives a really effective five minute overview on installing laundry and landscape systems. And don't worry, you have, you'll get lots of resources um, for other topics that we'll talk about. So who is Valley Water? Well, we used to be known as the Santa Clara Valley Water District. We serve nearly 2 million people in the South Bay, um, both the people that live here and work in Santa Clara County. We provide three core services. Clean, reliable water, we're the water wholesaler for our area. We provide flood protection services and healthy creeks and ecosystems. 
So you're all here today to learn about water conservation and reuse, and that's part of our clean, reliable water responsibilities. Now, we're only gonna talk about a few programs today. You can learn about all of our rebates and services that we offer at watersavings.org. A quick summary about what we, uh, how we actually get our water. Well, we serve 15 cities and 13 local water companies. So we actually uh, don't send a water bill to you. you. We make sure there's enough water in the county for your water company to deliver it to your home. Uh, we also serve nearly 5,000 well owners throughout Santa Clara County that pump water from the aquifer beneath our feet. And it varies year to year, but we import uh, about 50 to 60% of our water from the San Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, in addition to our groundwater supplies and local streams and waterways, as well as recycled water and water conservation. And this actually leads us to our first poll question. And now, don't worry, you will not have a lot of time to answer these poll questions. Uh, we want to get your gut response, so just do your best and don't stress out too much. Uh, uh, so the first question is, on average, where is most of our drinking water used in Santa Clara County? Is it mostly used indoors, outdoors, or is it a 50-50 split? And it may be surprising to some of you. So I'm just going to wait a moment with a smile on my face. And it looks like we have uh, a strong majority that most of our water is used outdoors followed by uh, indoors and 50-50 split being really close. So let's find out. We use about 50% of our water outdoors and indoors. So what's particularly interesting, like I mentioned a moment ago, we import about half of our water every year uh, from over 100 miles away, and we use half of our water outdoors to keep our landscapes green and healthy. And so conserving water, installing efficient irrigation equipment, and finding ways to reuse water and capture rainwater are all extremely effective ways of making our drinking water supplies more reliable and go further in our community's needs. Um, looking at who uses the water, it's a little more than half of our, of our water is used by residences. And here's something that's really interesting. Since the early 1990s, we use the same amount of water as we do today. So we have hundreds of thousands of more people in Santa Clara County, yet we, we consume the same amount of water. And that is thanks to people like you and people like you years before that that upgraded their toilets and clothes washers and uh, put in efficient irrigation equipment. It's all water conservation has been a main driver in us having a consistent amount of water use as population has increased. Um, looking indoors, you might wonder how do we actually use water inside our home? A little more than half could potentially be derived from gray water sources. And you'll learn about which of those in that pie chart you can get gray water from in just a few moments. So this is a, a drought monitor. This is something you can look up every month. It gets updated in the first week of every month throughout the year. And it gives you a snapshot of, uh, of our drought conditions throughout California. So right now, uh, well, as of October 6th, about two thirds of California was in some stage of drought. And now you may have heard that scientists uh, think that this winter will probably be a La Nina year, meaning it might be drier than usual. And so that can be concerning, but all the effort that you all have done over the last several years since our last major drought have really helped us withstand uh, short-term dry periods like what we might be facing because our aquifer is actually full. Having a full aquifer is like having a, a really healthy bank account that combined with a really diverse source of water supply will make sure that we're going to be well this winter. But what's important that I hope you all take away from tonight's webinar is that you can do projects today that will really help protect your landscapes and your property going forward so that whether we have just one dry year or a series of dry years, every action you take to conserve water and use water in more, uh, more unique and reuse water in, in more unique ways really helps save every drop of water for all of us. So keep up the great work and there's a lot more to do and I'm really happy to talk to you all about that tonight. So the next question is about our rebates. 
Uh, valley water offers rebates for gray water or rainwater or both. And yes, we provide more rebates than just what I listed there, but I only asked about those because that's what tonight's talk is about. All of the above, I'm really glad that uh, I didn't surprise over 90% of you. Uh, so we do uh, offer rebates for laundry to landscape gray water systems that I'll talk about, as well as rain barrel cisterns, rain gardens. And on the next slide, here's a quick summary of what we offer um, related to tonight's webinar. Many of you might already be familiar with our landscape rebate program. This provides a lot of different incentives for your landscape that you can participate in with a single application. So with our lawn removal program, you can remove either your lawn or even a pool and replace it with water-wise plants or California native plants that are uh, also water-wise uh, to get a rebate, which is really awesome. Uh, you can upgrade your irrigation equipment, or install rainwater capture equipment. You can get up to either $2,000 or $3,000 through those efforts. And what's great is you don't need to know every single possibility for your landscape. You can do projects and phases until you reach that maximum rebate amount. For gray water rebates, it does require a separate application. However, you can get an additional $200 or $400 for installing uh, a uh, Co's washer gray water system to our program guidelines. Um, you might be wondering, well, what's the maximum? I see two maximums up, up there. The maximum amount depends on your city or your water company, and we tell you that when you apply. So uh, before you start your project, you have a complete expectation of how much money you might be able to qualify for with your upcoming landscape project. Um, this next slide is a very fast overview about our landscape review programs application. You can get um, get your application started today at the web address you can see both on screen and in the chat box, scvwd.chocolateportal.com. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we're the water wholesaler and not the water company. So we do ask for a copy of a recent water bill and, um, and to give us an idea what types of projects that you're gonna do. We do ask for pre-inspection, on-site pre-inspections for certain types of projects, but other projects like rain barrels, you might be able to just do everything virtually where you send us a few photos of your landscape and downspouts, and that might be enough with some additional back and forth to get approved for a rebate. Uh, for any of our rebate programs, it's really essential to, to apply and wait for approval before you do any work or buy anything. So that is a key thing about any of our BB programs. Uh, I'm going to go, going to go through the next few slides pretty quickly because I really want to get to the meat of what you're all here tonight, which is to learn about gray water, rainwater capture. But just know that we do offer $35 per rain barrel. It does have to be a designated rain barrel. So we don't approve if you just put a bucket under uh, a downspout. That's, that's no good. And Hank will definitely tell you why that, uh, that's not appropriate. So we really uh, want to help make these types of projects as cost effective for you as possible. Um, and always check our website because we have some additional rules that I am not getting into tonight. We also offer 50 cents per gallon for cisterns. So uh, it does have to be at least a 200 gallon cistern, but you're looking at at least a hundred dollar rebate if you follow our guidelines. And cisterns can get really massive and Hank will tell you uh, later how big they can get. And just remember this number that it's 50 cents per gallon. And it really adds up. Finally, regarding rainwater capture rebates, we also offer rain garden rebates. This is based on $1 per square foot of your roof area that gets diverted into a rain garden. Rain gardens are really effective at slowing, spreading, and sinking rainwater into your landscape so it can infiltrate into the aquifer beneath our feet. Um, and it helps with any like storm surges. So it goes into the ground instead of down your street. There's a lot of great benefits you'll learn about tonight with rain gardens. Now with gray water. Separate application, you can see the URL uh, at the top of this slide. One key thing I recommend to people is to plan in advance. Um, gray water does require a separate application. There's no pre-inspection. There's no on-site pre-inspection though. I just ask for your water bills and photos of your landscape. 
uh, and your laundry area and a rough sketch of your plan. You do not need to hire a professional landscape designer to do your plan, although I do love looking at them. So you can send them to me if you happen to be doing it anyway. Um, and you do want to line up gray water projects with any other landscape project that you might be doing. So in the photos you see, the really happy customer just completed um, a lawn conversion, a rain garden, and a gray water rebate. So is she not, she's not only using really efficient irrigation equipment, capturing gray water so it goes into, capturing rainwater so it goes into her aquifer, but also reusing her laundry water in her landscape to grow fruit trees. It's really amazing. That grass you can see with all that went off, that's actually what her landscape used to look like. Um, if you have a bunch of wet sidewalks around your yard, consider applying for one of our various programs because water should really stay in your landscape and not the hardscape. Here's our next poll question. Uh, so this is the reason why you're all here tonight. Really excited to get into detail with all of you about it. So check all that above. Uh, check all that apply with this poll question. Where does gray water come from? Your clothes washer, showers and bathtubs, bathroom sinks, kitchen sinks, uh, dishwashers, toilets, rain barrels, or recycled water from purple pipe from your water treatment or purification plant. Don't worry, uh, if you don't have enough time, just give it your best shot. Well, I, I led the audience pretty well because all of you uh, knew it was clothes washers. Thank you. Um, showers and bathtubs, fantastic. Um, I see that recycled water is actually pretty popular. Gray water is really a decentralized local reuse of water without any treatment to it. So it really depends on your behavior and the types of products that you're using. Something like recycled water that comes uh, from a more centralized location. It has an immense amount of treatment and processing involved to make it really safe for our landscapes. Uh, but they do have very different uh, uh, benefits and sources than gray water. Gray, in in sim, sim, most simple way as possible, uh, gray water comes from your home and it's a decentralized way of reusing water. So bathroom sinks, showers and bathtubs, and clothes washers. I think I saw someone ask, um, why do we spend so much time on clothes washers instead of other types of gray water? And the short answer is that's a great question because showers and bathtubs do produce the most amount of gray water on average in your home, but they're really difficult or challenging to access because you either need dual plumbing uh, or you need to be doing another type of permitted project. So uh, if you're doing a bathroom renovation or you're demoing and building a new home. Those are all really great opportunities to use gray, start using gray water from your bathroom. Uh, with clothes washers though, it's just adding your a valve to your drain line and a few other guidelines that I'll talk about today. So you still get a large amount of gray water and it's a lot easier to do. Um, in California, kitchen sinks and dishwashers are not considered gray water. They have a lot of oils and salts and other issues with them. Toilets are not gray water. You can flush uh, toilets with gray water, but do not confuse the other way around. Uh, gray water cannot be stored for more than 24 hours. This is the key difference with rainwater capture, where you do want to store it for a long period of time. Gray water, really important to, to use it or lose it back down the sewer. Um, those fun loving people in the other corner, they are covered in paint and oil. So if we have any painters or mechanics in the audience tonight, whenever you're washing those clothes in your new clothes washer gray water system and they have a bunch of oil or chemicals or solvents on them, really essential to turn a little simple valve you'll learn about in a moment to the sewer. Uh, it's no longer considered gray water once it has a lot of those other uh, chemicals in them. So uh, that's a more extreme example. In general, gray water is just a little bit dirty, fine for most plants. So I can talk about this one slide for its own hour long workshop. So forgive me that I'm just gonna brush over it kind of quickly, but you can use gray water indoors for toilet flushing. 
Um, because we use about half of our water outdoors, it's much more cost effective to send gray water out to your landscape. If you're using it for your toilets, importantly, you can also use rainwater to flush your toilets. But in both examples, it requires a lot of treatment, permitting, maintenance, oversight, uh, and can be really costing on top of that. Regarding outdoor irrigation use, I always recommend start simply. Start the simplest way. Um, for many of us, that was a bucket in our shower during the drought. Um, we, um, you know, that's the best, that's the most cost effective way. You just put a bucket in your shower, you're good to go, you reuse that water uh, in your landscape. Downside is it's a little hard on your back um, and you might be looking for something more permanent. So then it's a laundry landscape system, but there are more high tech systems out there. They do require more maintenance, but they do have more uses to them than uh, laundry to landscape systems. So there's a greater variety in the types of plants and the distances that you can send gray water in a high, in a high tech system than with a laundry landscape. Um, some of you might be asking, wondering why is there a picture of a tank when a moment ago I said you don't store gray water. Um, that is a surge tank. So you may see gray water systems that have a surge tank which has a pump inside. And then that pump just waits till there's enough gray water in that little surge tank to activate itself and send gray water to the landscape. Uh, it still uh, will dump it down the sewer after 24 hours. The cartoon you see in the upper corner is an example system of a laundry and landscape system. There are no pumps, there's no filters. You're just using the soil itself and organic matter in mulch to spread out gray water and let it sink deep into the soil. Um, that's not gonna work for every property though. Um, maybe you have a bathroom project going uh, that you're planning and you really wanna use gray water from your shower. Uh, the next option is a branch drain system. That's the taller photo next to the cartoon. Um, those really work best when they're on a hillside because they're just using gravity to channel the gray water through the landscape. Um, but maybe you wanna send gray water up a hill. Now you don't wanna use your clothes washer to do that because your clothes washer does have a pump in it, but it's not designed to push gray water up a hill. So you will want an additional pump. Um, when you get a system with a pump on it, you want to think about how are you going to maintain it. So if it has a filter, do you want a system that has a self-cleaning filter or a physical filter that you clean out? If any of you have left clothes in, the, in your washer for a long weekend and then came back to that smell, that's kind of what your surge tank and pump filter might smell like. So think about that when you consider those types of projects. Because it can be a commitment, but it can be a really rewarding This is a summary of what applies to any type of gray water system. Importantly, you keep gray water on your property and out of sight. Gray water gets applied below the surface um, and you wanna use a three-way valve to direct gray water either to your garden or the sewer. Um, it always has an exit route. It can be harder to find three-way valves because it's still a burgeoning interest in people using gray water. So if you all want to be uh, really pioneering and, and starting these types of projects, just know that can be a little challenging, but um, the three-way valve is the, is the spine of a gray water system. Um, and then gray water also isn't, is not appropriate for root vegetables. It's growing right in the soil itself, like those carrots and beets. So uh, and that's because the gray water is coming in direct contact with the, with those root vegetables. In comparison, fruit trees do really effectively with gray water. Um, except for a couple of these stock photos, the majority of the photos in this presentation are all from people that have installed gray water systems through one of our rebate programs. Um, so those, that orange and apple, that's clearly a stock photo, but we have some photos of fruit trees later from actual properties and people really love it um, and how much fruit they've gotten from their gray water irrigated fruit trees. This last bullet point um, is related to maybe you don't you do a lot of laundry or maybe you do a lot of laundry, but you have a really efficient machine. 
um, and you want to send it to uh, a fruit orchard on your home. Maybe you have like over a dozen fruit trees. If you don't use a lot, of, if you don't do a lot of laundry, you don't have a lot of gray water to send. But what's really great about gray water is that every drop that you reuse in your landscape, even if it's just enough for one or two or three trees, it's that much more drinking water available for all of us and for yourself. And it's a really fantastic investment as we encounter more frequent dry winters and hotter, drier summers as well. Here's another poll question. So true or false, clothes washers, gray water systems can be installed without a permit if guidelines are followed. Over 80% of you are correct. You do not need a permit for a laundry and landscape system. You can follow guidelines. And lucky for you, the rebate program is structured to really help you follow all those guidelines. So not only can you get a $200 or $400 rebate from us, you don't need to deal with a permit. So that's another reason why we really want to emphasize people start with the simplest option that works best for them before considering other gray water sources or other types of gray water systems that do save water and are important to consider, but it's important to walk yourself through that step and what meets your needs. So the simplest system works, go with that. Um, this is an overview of a laundry to landscape system. You can make out a diverter valve that you'll see a close up of in a second. Uh, and then the other two photos are from an established, from two different established gray water landscapes. Um, let's dive a little deeper. So what does it look like inside? Well, inside you, I've mentioned this a couple of times, there's this three-way diverter valve. All you do is you pull out your washer drain line, hook it up to this diverter valve. And then on one side, it goes to your sewer, just like it does today. Um, if it goes into a sewer standpipe, it should be loose, just like it, like it is, or it can go into a utility sink, like in that photo. It also has what's called an air admittance valve or an auto vent. This helps uh, prevent a siphon effect if any of the audience has cleaned a fish tank in their life and they use a siphon to pull the water out. Um, that auto vent helps break that potential siphon. And then uh, the diverter valve and the auto vent are at the high part of the system. And then you do drill a hole in your wall. So you drill a hole in your wall, you seal that, and then you go outside. Um, when you go outside, there is some digging involved. Uh, yes, that is me laying some gray water pipe in a landscape. Um, it's a lot of fun, especially if you get a few do-it-yourselfers together. And I'm going to take a moment to talk about mulch basins. So mulch basin helps spread the gray water out as much as possible. And what, it, um, and what it really does is um, it almost acts like a filter, so you don't have anything smelly to clean out. You just make sure you have enough of a, of a footprint that it can take all the gray water that you might send to it in a day. These mulch basins are relatively simple in concept, even though the word is a little uh, new. Um, you, Dig the, you dig the trench, the bottom should be as flat as possible. The width can be about the width of a shovel or a little wider, and it can be any shape that you want, which is really the simplest way to describe it. But this is the, how gray water gets delivered to the, to the plants in your yard. And for our next poll question, how much gray water does a brand new Energy Star front loading clothes washer produce per load? Is it less than 15 gallons, 15 to 35 gallons, or more than 35 gallons? Great, I got some water conservation fans out here. Yes, uh, over 60% of you uh, were correct. It's less than 15 gallons for a Energy Star front loading brand new clothes washer. Um, older clothes washers, like a 20 year old clunker that's a top loader that's probably still out there, in comparison, they might produce as much as 45 gallons per load. So you could do 
three loads in your efficient machine and have the same amount of gray water as someone uh, with an old clunker, I definitely recommend going installing efficient equipment first and then installing your gray water system. But I love gray, gray water. It's a great system to consider. Uh, and I hope I'm convincing you. So here's another way to, to look at gray water production in your landscape. So if you have an Energy Star closed washer, it's about 15 gallons per load. On average, a fruit tree, a medium water use fruit tree in, in, uh, in Santa Clara County needs about 30 gallons per week in the summertime. So you can do two loads of laundry in a week and provide enough water that that fruit tree needs during the summertime. Uh, many of you probably do more than just two loads of laundry in a week, so that lets you expand it out uh, to other types of plants. Also, plants uh, have pretty large root zones, so the gray water can just be near the drip line and multiple plants can benefit from that gray water that you're sending out to your yard. Justin, quick question from Reed. Is diverting clothes washer water away from our septic system in any way detrimental to the septic operation? That's a great question, Reed. Um, I'm not an expert on septic uh, systems, but anecdotal, well, my quick answer is that you're sending less uh, liquid effluent to your septic tank, so it might prolong the period of time that you need to get it maintained. And I learned that through the County of Santa Barbara gray water uh, design. This County of Santa Barbara gray water handbook talks about septic tanks. It will be one of the resources we link to towards the end of my talk. Um, there is a section in that handbook about septic tanks and gray water use. Uh, so according to that resource, it actually can help by sending less liquid to your septic tank over time. Great question. Um, so, when you, so I've shared a lot of information with you. You might be wondering, well, how do I actually figure this out for myself? Uh, hopefully I'm a little convinced, I'm a little excited. I really boil it down to, to four topics to think about for your own home accessibility, topography and geography, and your landscape. So in regards to accessibility, a laundry and landscape system works best if it's not, uh, if it's about 50 feet or so from your landscape. Of course, if you have a crawl space, you can actually go pretty far um, and it will look like you've gone further than you have because you're able to go through that crawl space. That photo outside of that living room um, the clothes washer isn't on the other side of that window. It's somewhere else on the property. So you can actually send gray water pretty far even when following that 50 foot uh, threshold. Um, if you're going downhill, I'll talk about in a moment, you can actually go a lot further than that. If your clothes washer um, is on an exterior wall or a crawl space, that's really a, a key consideration. Um, and also if you have enough space, so you wanna make sure that your gray water uh, components are at least a foot and a half from your property line and a foot and a half from your foundation. Also, if you live near a riparian area or a water body, uh, your gray water system needs to be at least a hundred feet away. And regarding the septic uh, question, I think you need the gray water to be about 50 feet from the leach field, but don't quote me on that. Check my resources where I have that answer. And also if you're in an area with shallow groundwater. And when people apply, I actually look up how deep the groundwater is on your property. So not only can you get 200 or $400 from me, I can tell you how deep your groundwater is on your property. Uh, which Another quick question, thing. Justin. Go ahead. Follow up question from Reed. We are on a shared well, so we do not have water usage stats for our house. Can we still apply for the rebate? Yes, you can. Um, you would be the first well customer that's gone for me, but I'm pretty sure if you have a water bill to Valley Water, you would just send that like annual well usage account uh, invoice to me when you apply. Um, but I'm a really flexible person. So if you just give it your best shot and provide me what you think I need that's described on my website, I'm happy to work with you to figure out what actually, uh, what else I might need to really uh, put you over the, the hurdle and start installing one of these systems. With um, topography and geography, so that 50 foot rule I mentioned, that's for flat landscapes. If you're going down a landscape, no hard rule. 
Um, if you're on the second floor, if your clothes washer is on the second floor, it can be a little trickier to install, um, but you can actually go further because now you have gravity pushing uh, a little bit more with that drop from your second floor. If you're going down a hillside, you can see this blue tubing in that second photo. Um, that little curve shape helps slow the gray water down as it goes through the yard so it doesn't all just come out the bottom or that last outlet. And it's a little hard to see, but if you look closely, you can actually see the, the branch lines coming into the uphill side of those valve boxes. So again, you're using gravity and you're, uh, to your benefit, instead of investing in a bunch of equipment, you're just using natural processes and gravity to deliver reused water to your landscape. Um, there's also a picture of a retaining wall. Just make sure it's structurally sound before you drill in it, like in that photo. Small increases in elevation is fine. That photo near that rose bush, there's a little small retaining wall. That's, that's, that's fine to do. What you don't want to do is send gray water way uphill. You will need a pump for that. The last bullet point is about having an unobstructed edge. So this is really important to make sure your system is easy to maintain and free of clogs. So imagine um, your clothes washer's drain line. What you want to have happen with your gray water system is have a continuous path all the way out to your landscape that anything that gets pushed out of your clothes washer can plop into in your yard. Um, if it's like hair or lint, then it gets dropped into rich organic mulch where it will decompose in a really safely and have nutrients back into the soil. If you have uh, valves on every single outlet, then it might get clogged in one of those. So you want to make sure there's always an exit route in your landscape. Quick question from Kimberly. Our washer is in the basement and water goes into a sump pump from the water from the washer. How would we install the gray water system to a sub pump? That's a great question. I actually will need to get back to you. Can you email me Kimberly and I'll be happy to look into that for you. You might want to um, and it also depends on the layout of your basement. Like maybe um, if you go like six inches above the, the top of your clothes washer, it's near where you can go out the wall where it's at grade kind of, that's fine. Um, it's, it always takes some additional details or even photos are really helpful if you get into that sub pump question. So I hope to see an email or a follow-up from you. Great question though. Um, I just have a couple of slides left. Uh, Many of you might still be wondering, well, what about types of plants? Um, though I don't have a plant list, these are some really effective general guidelines to follow. Um, so remember, not most, most plants do not need drinking water. They're perfectly fine with, with other types of water sources that don't need to meet state and federal drinking water standards that we really rely on to stay healthy. A lot of plants can have a lot more variability in the type of water quality that it consume. And by picking appropriate detergents and designing your system effectively, it's a really fantastic way to reuse that water. Now, with that said, there are some more sensitive plants out there that have some salinity and pH tolerances. So, um, for example, ferns can be particularly sensitive, so they're not the best for gray water. Lawns aren't the best for gray water. They have a bunch of super tiny roots. Like I mentioned earlier, gray water works really best for, system, for plants with really large root zones. And because these systems require digging, a little bit of trenching and laying pipe, line it up with other types of landscape projects, you might need to go under a hardscape or a patio. You always have the option of converting that patio into a permeable hardscape so that the water will just go directly into the, walk, into the ground. Um, but you can shovel or actually you can get hose attachments or pressure washer attachments to the tunnel underneath your hardscape to send gray water from your home into the part of your yard where you need it. Finally, there's two really effective, effective resources to finding trained, experienced installers that know what they need to know for installing a gray water system. Both centralcoastgraywater.org and graywateraction.org have uh, training services that they've offered in the past and have really strong relationships with various contractors that work with both really simple systems like laundry and landscape 
or really high-end systems um, that use a gray water from a whole home. So check out those two pages uh, that are in your chat box. Um, and yes, they do spell gray water with an E. That's just the way of water reuse is that there's multiple ways to spell gray water. But luckily there's only a couple ways to spell rainwater. Um, one's with a space and one doesn't have a space. So with, uh, with detergents and soaps, the great thing about gray water use is that with the diverter valve, you now have the choice. You have the choice to either reuse that water or send it to the sewer. So if you need to use, a, uh, use bleach in your clothes, to clean your clothes, you can still do that. Just turn that valve to the side and send it to the sewer. In general, liquid detergents are better than de powder detergents because liquid detergents will have a liquid, will have a water base to them as opposed to a powder detergent, which is like a salt base. So choose liquid detergent. Um, and your chat box will also have some really direct resources to help you find specific detergents. Um, the US EPA's See for Choice brand helps you find uh, products with really low toxicity um, that are safe for humans and the environment. The USDA bio-based products helps you find products that are based, uh, either plant-based or biologically based and read their website for more details. Um, shortly about water softeners, many of us in Santa Clara County have water softeners. Just check whether it's a sodium or a potassium base. You really want to choose either a potassium based water softener. Some softeners, you just swap out the medium so you can go from sodium to potassium or look into a salt free option that are more common. And sorry for the flashbacks to high school chemistry of all the um, pH and uh, salt talk. So that was a ton of information, but don't worry. You can actually find a three hour workshop of me and a representative from Greywater Action that was done a couple years ago on our website that you can see in your chat box and on screen. It's divided into four easy to digest parts where you can really dive deep about what I talked about today. And there's also a dedicated section on shower Greywater systems. So I really recommend checking that out for more information. Um, this old house from PBS has that five minute how to video. And you can find other guides like that Santa Barbara County gray water guide that I referenced a moment ago. So in conclusion, why start using gray water? Well, it can be simple and fun. I really love hearing from customers that had a really positive experience. And I really hope that even 10% of you that joined this, this workshop tonight join the over 100 other people that have installed laundry to landscape gray water systems through Valley Waters rebates programs. They're really cost effective, they're easy to maintain, and they're a really great introduction to gray water reuse. And we'll give you $200 or $400 on top of that. What else can you ask for? There's my contact information. Um, please remember to like and subscribe to our video series. We're really happy offering this to the community and also sign up for our Valley Water e-newsletter in addition to everything else. Thank you all so much. And I hope you lear love learning about rainwater capture from Hank Morales. And I'm just gonna swap presentations as quickly as I can. Are there any questions that I can answer while I'm preparing this screen super quick? Yes. How deep does the groundwater need to be to use this system? We, uh, we require the groundwater to be five feet or deeper. And that's something I, I look up when you apply. So yeah, don't, don't dig a five foot hole in your yard. Don't do that. I'll, I'll just look it up for you. Justin, uh, can you guys see the, my introduction slide here? Yeah. Thanks, Hank. It's your show now. I'll talk to you all at the Q&A towards the end. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, that's uh, Justin just covered a, like a two-hour seminar on gray water, and I'm going to try to catch up here and give you another two-hour uh, talk about harvesting rainwater. Um, uh, if we could uh, put up that first poll question, do you have that available for 
our group here tonight? There you go. So here's a question, uh, rainwater capture. Um, if you're harvesting uh, rainwater, what, what are the benefits? Um, and, uh, and then, oh, we've got two questions. So uh, true or false, uh, you need uh, to treat rainwater if you ca do capture it. Go ahead and answer that real quick. We'll take a couple of seconds here and uh, see where, where we're starting from. Okay, all of above and faults. Wow, I've got my work cut out here. Um, so um, once again, I'm uh, Hank Morales and we're gonna talk a little bit about capturing the rain water that comes to us here in California. Um, it, you haven't always been able to do that. Um, it, it wasn't until 2012 that our, our state legislators uh, made it legal uh, throughout California to harvest the rainwater off your own roof or buildings on your uh, property. So um, there's different ways to, uh, to do this, but uh, uh, we're starting to see more and more um, property owners. Oh no, it looks like we lost Hank. Okay, I will do my best. One moment, please. Hey, sorry about that. Um, so, I believe Hank was talking about the history of rainwater capture, and feel free, uh, any other uh, panelists that really want to talk about rainwater capture until Hank comes back. But in the meantime, as he was mentioning, it wasn't until 2012 that California allowed rainwater capture for residential and commercial and government properties. Um, there's a lot you can talk about with rainwater capture and for time we're really going to focus on rainwater capture for garden and landscape use. Um, and we won't talk about rainwater catchment for potable in home use. And like I mentioned in my uh, gray water portion of the talk, you can, you can use rainwater to flush toilets, but that does require permitting and a bunch of other steps that we won't go into tonight. Um, and there are rebates uh, available to you, just as a refresher, uh, $35 per rain barrel. You can install multiple rain barrels, 50 cents per gallon for cisterns. You have to um, install at least a 200 gallon cistern, or you can get a rebate for a rain garden, which is a dollar per square foot of roof area diverted into that rain garden. So why use rain in your garden? Well, apologies as I go too close to my camera, let's find out. So as rain runs down your property, it can pick up a lot of pollutants and fertilizers, particularly as it goes over like a grassy landscape. So that gets even worse once that water gets into the street where it might pick up oil and other uh, other pollutants from cars and just urban behavior and equipment. And so by capturing rainwater so that it stays on your property for when you need it, or for letting it infiltrate deeper into the soil, those are all huge benefits to the environment because it will still ultimately lead to the aquifer beneath our feet but it'll be much cleaner because it's gone through the soil much slower and it won't pick up nearly as many as pollutants as when it goes through uh, just down the street. Also, hey Justin, yeah. are you sharing the slides? Oh no, I'm sorry. Thank you. My apologies. You're all Thank just you. smiling and slamming your keyboards. I'm sorry, everyone, one moment. No problem. Can I ask you a great water question that we have? Oh, sure. Oh, thank you. And thanks everyone for your patience. Um, one of the questions is, if there is a water softener using potassium salt and there is also a washing machine on the other side of the house, can two gray water systems be applied? Uh, that's a great question. I do recommend checking your water softener's owner's manual because some water softeners need a dedicated type of medium to work properly, whereas others you can swap out the types of salt. So some you can actually go from sodium to potassium without a lot of extra steps on your part. 
Now, potassium, medium uh, is a little more expensive and harder to find, but I feel that's the way with a lot of environmental and sustainable endeavors. It tends to cost a little bit more and be a little more challenging at first, but it uh, just makes it much more rewarding in pursuing those types of opportunities and alternatives for your home and the community. Um, and then can two gray water systems be applied? I'm assuming you have two uh, clothes washers on your property. That's a great question. Um, I encourage you to apply and I will look into that question for you once I see your application. Um, and so I'm gonna go back to rainwater just so we make sure that we cover enough time until Hank comes back. Um, I was talking a moment ago about the importance of slowing rainwater down so it can actually uh, not pick up as many pollutants and also if it deep uh, infiltrates in the soil, it'll help clean that rainwater. Well, as you can see on the slide, um, over 50% of rainwater infiltrates into the ground, about 40% gets evaporated or taken up by plants, and 10% runs off the surface. Um, that includes not only natural surfaces, but our urban landscapes, uh, sidewalks, roads, with all the oils and grease that's, that's on that. So by capturing rainwater on your property, you really help ensure that as much of it po as possible uh, gets slowed down. It's really similar to, um, to wetlands in, a, in concept where we, use, we only have about 1% of our historic wetlands left in California, and those really help slow water down, uh, especially during flood situations. And when we capture and slow water down through our own rain barrels and cisterns and rain gardens, we can provide similar services of making sure that we don't get deluges through our communities. Um, to, as an extreme example. So it might not seem like a, uh, I can, well, you know, it's just a couple rain barrels, but it really adds up because we have over 2 million people here. Um, so going, going on, um, in urban areas that have runoff, I mentioned is actually even more in urban areas because you don't have permeable hardscapes. So permeable hardscapes like, um, um, like gravel or decomposed granite, um, even flagstone, those are all examples of permeable hardscape where the water can actually sink into the ground when it's a pretty hard surface. Uh, things like cement or asphalt, the water will just sit there and slick off the side and that's why the runoff increases. Um, and plants love rainwater. Um, is a master gardener no way plants love rainwater besides how fantastic capturing rainwater is. I'm reasonably confident, but this is one reason why I love the master gardeners because they're really great at answering these kinds of questions. I do know that rainwater has a different pH than our drinking water does. And so that does influence how plants can take up nutrients over time. Um, and that means that they can be healthier over time. So they love capturing rainwater and we really hope that you consider it. Hey Justin, it looks like we have Hank back. Thank you, Hank. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen everyone and uh, uh, welcome back Hank. He can't hear you clap. <laughs> Sorry guys, I had a technical malfunction, I guess. I just switched routers. So uh, hopefully this, this that solves my problem. Um, I think um, I just covered the why you use rainwater in your landscape, and I gave a okay. shot at answering why plants love rainwater. But if there's anything really essential that you would like to add, uh, we're about done with that slide, just for context. Okay, so let me just get back back to my PowerPoint here. Um, ah, so. You had covered why we're using it. You've discussed this slide already? I did my best. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to resume from there. If I can just find my start slideshow, current slide. Okay. Are, does that look okay, guys? Um, sorry about that, folks. Um, so 
Um, Justin is probably uh, discussing, uh, you know, the amount of water that uh, because we have built buildings that we are sending a lot of the water that lands on our property uh, into the um, into the streams and to the bay and our other bodies of water around here. And we um, would like to, to prevent that. The ideal situation is let all the rain that comes to our neighborhoods to stay on the property where it first landed to help uh, replenish our aquifers so that we have a constant source of drinking water. So, um, and then the other reason is that the plants love rainwater. And I heard Justin mention uh, earlier in the gray water uh, section, we did talk about how uh, we use water softeners because the water is so hard. And um, the, um, the uh, rainwater, of course, hasn't come via uh, aqueducts and uh, storage places and it hasn't picked up all the minerals. And so it is, uh, the plants like it because it's uh, softer water. So one of the ways we can use, uh, uh, catch rainwater and put it to use in our gardens, uh, the easiest, it's almost like uh, your gray water uh, system that Justin just spoke about. And that's to divert the rainwater off our roofs down the uh, drain pipes and into um, the, uh, the landscape around our homes. Uh, you would wanna make sure that of course it's not pooling up next to the foundation of your home or backing into the crawl space. So if you uh, have it graded in such a way uh, that you could create ponding areas like little dry streams and Justin has shared some uh, photographs of that. So swales, berms, uh, and if you have a, 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 a property that has a grade to it where it slopes down, uh, you can terrace that uh, so that uh, when the rain goes, it doesn't just slide down the hill, that it, uh, it actually stops at each of these levels and uh, is absorbed into the landscape. So those are the easiest ways uh, to do that. And here you have uh, a nice uh, diagram of uh, three different zones um, and you can uh, find um, different uh, plant lists. You can go to um, the California Native uh, plant Society has a great website uh, and plant list that you can use to um, populate your landscape and uh, that's a really good way to do that. Um, so the other way is uh, with a, a retention swale and this is an example of a, a system that you would engineer into your hardscape. So if you had um, a drive, it says roadway or pavement, that could be your driveway and a sidewalk. And then you have a, a earth uh, space here that would normally be landscape. And what you do is you dig down and you create a well basically down here to where the water could actually run off of these surfaces and stay here in this uh, center area. Um, and then, you end up keeping this water and give it time to absorb into your uh, landscape instead of running off down into the street. So the other way to store it and is to create a rain barrel catchment system. And it could be as simple as, um, I don't know, can you guys see my pointer, uh, Justin? Yes, we can. Okay, so in this case here, it could be as simple as uh, th these both have rainwater and this is a, a, a just a recycle bin and this is a 33 gallon container. I, so for this family, I replaced them with two 55 gallon uh, food grade uh, barrels. 
we diverted the water from the roof into a, a two inch pipe and then hooked up to the uh, attachments that are built into these barrels. These are sealed barrels, so there's no, uh, no way for uh, any insects or anything to get into these barrels. And you could put a little screen over this overflow here. So the rain comes down, fills up this barrel, comes over when this barrel's full, it fills up this barrel. And then um, if it overflows, it would come out here in, into the landscape. If you have one of these, you want to put it uh, near where the normal uh, downspout would be. And then one of the important things is you need to elevate it a little bit because it, you're going to need to uh, use a, uh, a valve down here to let the water out. So you can either let the water out and just hook up a hose to this. This has a hose attachment, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And it has a uh, this has a, a three quarter inch uh, gate valve, and so and th this is a three quarter inch ball valve, and those allow the water. You can shut this one off and just take all this water out, and then later take this water. One of the things that you want to make sure um, that you do is not allow uh, access for mosquitoes because, well, you want to take time to save your water and use it in your landscape. Um, it, you don't want to make a habitat for mosquitoes, which creates a, a health problem for the neighborhood. So keep it simple. Um, you can spend lots of money. There's people that will come out and uh, uh, help you spend a lot of money to set up one of these. This is, system was set up relatively inexpensive. We were able to get these two barrels for free and probably about $30 worth of uh, pipe uh, materials to create this system, uh, and including these four bricks. If you do build up a space, do not um, build up the ground around here above the mud seal on your house because you don't want water running back into your crawl space. Hi, Hank, quick question. Yes, Does the ahead. rain barrels have to be in a shaded area? No, they do not. Um, I have uh, barrels around my house. Um, they do not have to be shaded. You'd be surprised at how cool the water stays even in the summertime. Although most of your water is going to be gone before the dead of summer, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the other thing that um, people ask a lot is, do you have to protect it from the sun because of algae and things like that? Even if the water uh, gets a little bit of algae, that's not a problem for your landscape. Uh, it's just a little bit of extra biomass that goes into the soil, and that takes care of itself. Um, you can, uh, those blue rain barrels, uh, the blue uh, barrels here are paintable. So if you had a latex paint, you want to match the color of the house, you could do that. Um, so, so how much rain can you collect? So that's often asked question. A rough uh, rule of thumb is for every uh, one inch of rain um, on a thousand square foot of roof surface, you can uh, capture 600 gallons of water. Uh, it says, uh, so we, as uh, Justin mentioned earlier, this El Ni uh, La Nina year that we're looking at, uh, we're gonna have sporadic rain, if any, and it may not be our average. Our average is, uh, varies widely throughout the county. If you live up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, it could be as high as 38 inches. Um, if you live in one of the rain shadows in Santa Clara County and, and Sunnyvale or someplace, it could be uh, quite a bit less. But the average is around 12 to 14 inches annually. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you want to elevate the barrel so you have a little bit of a, a space, uh, you know, a little bit of gravity to help you uh, get all the water out of those barrels. Um, also, you want to, this time of year, whether you have rain barrels or not, you want to check your rain gutters now before it starts raining. 
you don't want water pooling up in your rain gutters and you don't want the debris actually going into um, into your rain barrels. So um, what you do with the excess water that you collect is in the previous example, and I'm going to show you here in an, another slide, is that you have to have a way for it to, once your barrel becomes full, as it has to either go off into the landscape, into your rain garden, or into a drain system. Um, Another strategy you have to think about is when to use the stored rainwater. So our rain, uh, when we get ra our rain season starting, probably the uh, bulk of it's going to come in January, February, and March. And it, it doesn't always, it's not every few days. It's sometimes we can have a week or 10 days in between. So what I do, um, and I think it's important to, to think about this is as you're coming towards the end of uh, you've maybe got your rain system full and you see that you, there's a 60% chance of rain coming uh, over the weekend, let's say, I would go ahead and use as much of the rain water now into your landscape uh, and so that your rain catchment is ready to get new fresh rainwater. Don't wait until July to use it all. Okay, does that make sense? Um, and of course, we uh, had this in one of the polls. Uh, do you need to treat the rainwater? And the answer is no, you do not need to treat the rainwater. Hi, Hank, quick question. Yeah. If rainwater uh, in barrel has algae and it will be used in vegetable garden, will this affect vegetables? If not, what treatment is needed? Um, so I, I, um, I used it only for uh, my summer vegetables. Winter vegetables are gonna get probably all the rain they need. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't uh, wanna probably put it on the root vegetables. Everybody, all the rest of the uh, plants in your, uh, if you're growing broccoli and cabbage and things like that, it's not going to affect them at all. If you're growing carrots and stuff, and I don't know that there is a study, I, I honestly can't uh, answer that. I'm, I don't know if there's any botanists on board, but uh, I can check that and get back on the website to the hot, send, a, send us a question if you would to our help desk and I bet we'll get an answer uh, by the end of tomorrow. Um, so here's an example of a, 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 a drawing of a system. So you have your roofing, about the only roofing they say that you probably should think twice about is uh, shake roofs. Although I think most people have replaced most of their shake roofs. Uh, the, shake roofs have some uh, issues with uh, leaching out things, the treatment for the shingles. Every other kind of roof, asphalt roof, uh, the uh, tile roofs and so forth is not a problem. Um, we'll talk here in a minute about a, a screen to put over the top, uh, different ways to keep debris from going into your, um, into your tank, but you wanna divert the water down it comes down one, if you're concerned about debris getting into your tank, you can have a, a first flush uh, pipe like this. You just put the pipe in the line, the water will come in, any, any uh, debris will fall in and gravity will take it down here. Once this is full, then the water comes into your tank. And then um, you do need a little air vent up here um, most of the larger tanks have a tank access up here. That stays closed all the time. And then a way to let the water out when it uh, fills up. Then you're gonna have a, a smaller uh, pipe here. I, I like no less than three quarter inch pipe, but I, uh, my first preference is one inch and I'll talk about why in a second. And then a faucet, uh, they do show um, most of these drawings you see, they'll show you a water faucet, just like on the side of your house. And I don't like those, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Here's two examples of uh, 
diversion kits that you can buy. One, you drill a hole in the side of the downspout that you have. This one here, you would just cut the downspout and then slide it in here and then sit this top and then it diverts out into your tank system. Okay, let's go on to the next slide here. So um, they come in all sizes, don't they? Um, so at Marshall Carl Park, these are the tanks we've set up uh, in our demonstration garden. So we have a, a 72 foot by uh, 36 foot uh, greenhouse. Uh, so we have 2,500 square feet essentially of uh, roof space. Don't worry about the, you just measure the length and the width of the building. Don't worry about the gable. Um, that will help you calculate. In our case, um, uh, we have two 5,200 gallon tanks. And so we can, uh, with five inches of rain, those will become full. If I get five inches of rain this winter, these tanks will be full. They're empty right now. This is 2,500 square, uh, 2,500 gallon tank. That's a little bit smaller. One thing you want to make sure is if you're going to go big, uh, do not get a tank that's taller than where you're going to draw the water off the roof. I had a lot of questions when I ordered these tanks. They said they're too wide, but the next size tank was higher. Uh, the the in this spot on the tank was higher than the downspout here, so I needed to keep the the water going downhill. And then this one, you can see it comes in and it it uh, has an overflow over here. Um, these tanks also. Um, fill up. These are 700 or 50 gallon uh, tanks and uh, they're pretty nice. They take up a less space, but for most homeowners, I don't think most homeowners are going to find this comfortable to have these large tanks. If you have a big lot, maybe. And then this one here, they're tied together at the bottom and there's also valves down here. You can see how it comes off of the two top roofs and also comes off this side roof into the tank, okay? So we talked about ways to use this water. So one of the things that we uh, recommend as a first choice is uh, with, without even having a tank is just to simply, rather than having the downspout going into a gutter system that goes to the street, divert it into the yard. And then you can have a beautiful rain garden um, next to the downspout. So this little rain garden demonstration, uh, there's uh, two of them and they're at the opposite end of this uh, pavilion. And so portion of the water goes in here, but at the other end, it goes down into the rain garden. And uh, so we have some really nice uh, uh, plants here. This is a, um, a Oregon uh, uh, grape uh, berry bush and I'm, we'll I'll send you a link to the national uh, to the uh, native plant society um, the, right here is this, their link and they have um, some uh, really nice plant choices for these rain gardens in our case and you can think about this is we have two rain gardens a little one here and one just opposite and we tied them together under the ground about three feet down. We dug a trench and buried a four inch pipe so that if rain comes more to the one side or the other, it gets equalized in uh, both sections. And of course, uh, it's great for uh, pollinators and wildlife to come visit your garden. So here's some things, uh, some components that I recommend. So you can either use a ball valve. Uh, this is a one inch ball valve. And this is a three quarter inch uh, brass ball valve. Uh, the brass one uh, for uh, if you have any kind of carpal tunnel or weak wrist, this is much easier to operate than this one. This is kind of stiff. So then once you get to the end of that, you want to be able to hook it up to either a pump or to a hose. 
Um, so if you open this up, that's why I like the one inch. So my, I have a pump like this. You would like to have at least a half, in, a half horsepower pump and you can hook it up to your rain barrel. The water would come in and then you would be able to put one of these uh, on the top and hook it up to a hose. Then you can put it anywhere in the yard you want. You could also hook that up to a, a drip system. This one is a uh, national pipe thread, uh, regular three quarter inch national pipe thread to a, on one side. And then on the other side, it uh, is actually for a hose uh, pipe thread. And then this is the same in brass. The brass one's more durable. And so if you have a, uh, this is a national pipe thread side, and on this side, you'd hook your hose right onto that. Here's two different uh, ways that you can keep the debris out of your tanks. And this is a simple little uh, thing you can purchase at any uh, hardware store or nursery. And it's uh, uh, it looks like a little basket and you stick it in the downspout of your rain gutter, wherever it's coming the downspout, you stuff this in there and it'll keep the leaves out. A little more money, uh, being spent and you can keep the leaves out all together all the time and there's this is just one example and there's uh, lots of different designs of how to keep the leaves out of this rain gutter okay uh, so this is uh, I was asked last time about this is a uh, electric pump of course you could um, also they do have gas powered pumps but uh, my house is all electric, so I use electric pump. Um, so that's uh, it. How am I doing on time? I'm just about done. Uh, thanks for uh, coming and, and participating in our talk tonight. Um, we have a, a list here of for more information. Of course, you're gonna if you get excited about this at all, you're gonna need more information. So um, we have. Uh, our Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County website. Um, we have also our uh, upcoming events uh, link. So you can find out more events that are coming along. On the 15th of uh, November, we're gonna have an open house at Marshall Cottle Park. And you're welcome to come out that day, no reservation required. And uh, we'll be glad to uh, let you look at our rain catchment systems at Marshall Cardinal Park, and um, be glad to discuss more uh, about that. Um, and then uh, some of the other things are, uh, these are for the rebates and uh, that Justin talked about earlier in the presentation. And then for the rain garden design, this is um, an article on, uh, uh, a really well-written article on uh, rain garden, okay? Justin, I think uh, that's that's my presentation. So, if we um, want to take uh, questions, thank you both so much. Uh, that was really wonderful presentation, very informative. We do have one question right now, but I'd like to ask everybody to go ahead and enter your Q and A. Um, we've got until 7.30 tonight, so if you do have any pending questions, we tried to do our best to answer them um, between this um, presentation, but if you have any other questions, go ahead and submit them now. I'll start with the question that's submitted. If the house does not have gutters, any alternative to collect rainwater? Wow, that's, that's a good one. Um, so uh, if you don't have rain gutters at all, um, if there's um, like a valley to where you have a, um, a you know, one of the, the roof comes down in this direction and this one where those two meet is called a valley and that's probably where you're going to find water coming down. Um, one, of, one of the things you could do is uh, I've seen in different parts of the country where they just actually attach a chain to that spot and the water goes down the chain and you can put that into a barrel. You would have to be uh, careful to make sure that um, that you have a screen system so that the it's not open for insects. 
uh, mosquitoes specifically. So. Great, thank you, Hank. I don't see any other questions coming in right now. I can't believe we, we answered everybody's fun. question. What's that, Justin? Oh, I, you can ask us anything you want at this point. You can talk about gray water or rainwater, yeah. questions about our water supply, or what else we can do to help you, what you missed out at a past, or what you have looking forward to at a future Facebook live series from Valley Water. You have us, so. <laughs> I suppose we can get a few more moments just in case anyone's typing. Yeah. But, um, but I really appreciated all of your time today. I had a really fantastic time. I'm going to stop talking because it looks like there's a question. Yes. Uh, if the property is near a busy street, such as a highway, are there studies that show that pollutants from cars do not mix with the roof and to the rain barrels? So um, your, uh, the, the answer is no, there's no way to filter out pollution. So um, the, if there's pollution near your home, you're going to, the rain will collect and um, uh, whatever's in the air when it starts raining and that will be dispersed in around the neighborhood. Uh, including pollution that started far, far away. And of course, everybody's heard about acid rain and stuff. And that's basically pollution uh, that has over, you know, wide areas collected in the storm clouds and brought it someplace else. So if there's, for instance, um, my solar system collects all the dust from the fires and the first flush of rain is, you know, I've, I've already washed mine off, but the, that, that will come off your roof and into the water. Um, and so I don't know that there's any studies that uh, 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 talk about that. I know that if you go to the Open Space Authority and you walk up in the hills around here, they talk about uh, car pollution and how the nitrogen oxide that uh, you know the in, ends up in the air from the car's exhaust ends up on the hillsides, and it comes out to something like a half a pound of nitrogen per acre, and that's what makes our hills so green in the in the springtime. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have so much grass up there, and we wouldn't have to rake it so much for the summertime during fire season. Great, thanks, Hank. Here's another question. How long can you keep rainwater in the barrels? So um, you probably shouldn't think about keeping rainwater past one season. Um, one of the other things that uh, you can use it for is, and, and we talk about using it for landscape, and that would be the primary focus on that. But if you had to say wash off a something spilled on your driveway or something, this would be an excellent way to save potable water is to use the rainwater to, if you had a little pump, you can wash your car or, or wash off your lawn furniture or something like that. But um, I personally uh, use mine every year. It's by, by this time of the year, it's pretty much, I just emptied up the last of it. I've got one, one container left. I'm waiting for the rain to come. So, but um, you wouldn't want to keep it past one year. And the one big 250 gallon tank I have does get algae because it's not uh, coated. You know, it does you know sun can get in there, and so that uh, it does have a tendency to get some biomass going. Thanks, Hank. Here's another uh -huh. question. What are the advantages and the disadvantages of a pump that is inside the rainwater tank? Oh, um, so it's uh, the inside the rainwater tank would be um, like a sump pump, and I have one of those as well. So um, my original uh, system that I put up was just trash cans, 
And so the only way to get it out was to put the sump pump in and then hook a hose onto it and pump it out. And that's what I did. At, or it was either that or a bucket. And so um, it's uh, just a little more convenient to just go over and turn it on, let gravity give you the water than to have a sump pump. But that's perfectly acceptable if that's, uh, you know, what, what you have. The blue rain barrel, the blue 55 gallon barrels are sealed. So there's only a, a, a small opening to hook up the, the water. And so the, you couldn't put a sump pump down inside unless you cut the lid off. You Thanks, could do Hank. that. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you want to do a rainwater barrel in the property, where do you start? Ooh, I have something so, to cut the hink off with. Um, uh, start by applying for a rebate because you need to apply yeah. for a rebate and get approved before you buy anything. So that's the first step. Your show, Hank. <laughs> good, good point, uh, Justin. Yeah. So if you're planning on getting a rebate, definitely, uh, as Justin said, whether it's for gray water or rainwater, uh, put in uh, for your rebate first and so that you can get your system approved. Doesn't have to be fancy one way or the other, but as long as it's approved, then you're gonna get some money back and that may help. Um, but then uh, just logistically, you need to find a, a space that's gonna be out of the way. Maybe your garage sticks out a little bit on one side and that's a nice uh, out of the traffic area and there's a downspout there that so, some place it's uh, out of the way. Some place that you know it's not. You don't want it right, right next. You know you don't want to take up space on your patio with rain barrels if you don't have to. Um, so around the side of the house somewhere, somewhere convenient to your garden, and then of course you need a downspout is would be ideal uh, to be able to uh, capture it. Technically, um, you could put up four poles and a tarp and a weight and capture rain right out of your yard and into a barrel, but uh, that's kind of complicated. Thanks, Hank. All right, we've got uh -huh. about two minutes left. Here's a question I believe for Justin from DJ. Do we need to take any specific permit from the county if we want to use drain water to route to a garden? If you mean drain water from your pool washer or drain line, no. But there is a catch-all in the code where the code does require you to check with your local enforcement agencies or your local building or permitting department just to make sure they don't have any additional rules for you to follow with a laundry landscape system. There's none that I'm aware of that don't follow our, uh, that our rebate program does not also follow. But it is a best practice regardless with any type of program that you want to participate in is just to do a quick check with your building, local building department. And that also goes for anyone that happens to be listening to this presentation and they may not live in Santa Clara County. So check uh, not only your local uh, building department, but also maybe your local water department. I'm gonna answer another question. It looks like someone uh, here from y Yuba County. Um, so every all the rebates are specific to Santa Clara County residences and businesses, but check with your local water uh, agency possibly even public works to see if they offer any type of gray water or rainwater rebate incentives. And Justin, uh, with that in mind, uh, for rainwater, uh, I think you guys have, uh, uh, you know, if you want to use rainwater for inside the house, you're going to need permits for that. Also, uh, I didn't mention earlier that um, uh, for rain barrel systems, um, if you live in an HOA or plan unit development, you may need to get permission from your homeowners association also. So uh, there's different layers of authority over what you can and can't do with your property. But the rainwater should be approved. I don't think that's a problem. It's, I, I did live at, in a PUD where the house is mine, but the property uh, surrounding the house, I only own like six inches outside the physical uh, building and the rest is common area. So you, you gotta be careful of adopting common area. Thank you all. Uh, do we have time for maybe one more question? 
finish up here. Um, my yeah. property is not so big. Can I store rain barrels underground? Yes. Um, and again, you would have to uh, uh, check with, uh, you may have to get permits for that in uh, certain uh, jurisdictions and of course in a PUD, but um, there are plenty of designs and, um, and the people have uh, up in Santa Cruz uh, that are on wells and stuff uh, have huge uh, underground water storage. Uh, some of them are required because of fire code but uh, definitely you could do that. Um, and like I say, you just have to get uh, the permits and stuff. Thank you everyone so much for attending our event tonight. Um, if we didn't get to your question or if you have any other questions, I know we supplied so many links tonight. So I will be sending out a follow-up email through Eventbrite with all of this great information and further information to get in touch with us if you do have further questions. So thanks again so much for attending and hope you all have a great evening. Thanks, thank Emily. You. Albert and Louise, thank you again for all your support tonight. We appreciate it. Really fantastic panelists. Thank you all. Couldn't have done it without you.